Well, welcome everyone to the session here at Exemplar Global's Excellence in Auditing Expo 2024. I'm your host, Michael Richmond, and I'm here today with our president and CEO of Exemplar Global, Andrew Baines. And we're going to have a little session today, a little different from some of the other sessions that are here at the Expo this year. We're going to kind of do a little conversation and a retrospective and a look forward in honor of Exemplar Global's 35th anniversary. So, Andrew, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Mike. I'm looking forward to the conversation. It's going to be fun. I think it's going to be fun for everyone out there as well. So, awesome. yeah. So as we as we talked about, as I just mentioned, this is our 35th anniversary. Exemplar Global, uh, our, our antecedents go back to 1989. So we're celebrating 35th year. Um, so in that time, a lot has changed. I mean, a lot has changed in this industry uh, of quality and, and conformity assessment. And you've been there for, for most, if not all of it. So what what are kind of some of your memories and recollections and retrospectives on on where we've come from over these 35 years? Well, it's a, it's a good question, Mike, and the, it, there's a very good fit, actually, mm -hmm. certainly with my own career, but also I think with the quality assurance movement in many respects. I first got into this, um, I worked in the dairy industry in the UK mm -hmm. in the 80s, and uh, I had a a gentleman who owned the company I worked for, who had a lot of foresight, and he sent me off to do an audited training course in 1987. 87, okay, right. Now, this was before ISO 9000, so it was a British standard mm -hmm. that was the baseline for it, but he, was, he, he could see this quality assurance coming down the track at us, and so he sent me off to do a lead audited training course, five-day training course. So you can see where this is going already. I fell into this by accident. I was working in uh, quality control in uh, the dairy industry mm -hmm. and was sent off to do this and went back like many others do uh, to find out about the standard and what are the auditors going to ask us about when they come in mm -hmm. and back I went into my own industry and started putting in systems and procedures into place giving no thought to auditing whatsoever and uh, some years later, two or three years later, um, we emigrated to New Zealand and I was hoping to get a job in the dairy industry, which I did. Uh, but it was a dreadful job, frankly. It was uh, uh, not the right thing for me. So six months later, um, I was looking to change jobs and I saw a certification body in New Zealand asking for auditors. Now, I'd only just turned 30 at that stage, so I was just a young fellow. Mm -hmm. um, your viewers might think that I'm not much more than 30 now, but I am <laughs> I a deal more than that. And um, so I went and applied for this job and they were desperate. They were looking for mm -hmm. anybody at the time. This was just at the start of that wave of what became ISO 9000. Well, I was going to say, so this is this is a few years after you had gone through the initial training. Right. Was around 1990. Yes, okay. that would have been 1990. That's okay. exactly right. Got it. And so I saw 9,000 and 1, 2 and 3 were in place at that stage mm -hmm. and um, we were looking for auditors. Now, what I would say is that it was only quality at the time. There wasn't anything else yet at that point. So along with a, a, another friend of mine who started at the time, we, we became friends. We used to stand outside having a chat and well, they've scraped the bottom of the barrel with us too, <laughs> haven't we? Uh, you know, they really must be desperate to have taken us to one. And and yet here I am, sort of 35 years later, and uh, had that experience of that period of time, very much along the lines of Exemplar Global. Now, back in that time, Exemplar Global was RAB and QSA. Mm -hmm. They hadn't yet merged. Bridged. And I was certified with QSA, the Quality Society of Australasia. Both were established to certify auditors. Mm -hmm. And so that was mine. I've still got some of the cards of uh, my auditor registrations with QSA, the Quality Society of Australasia. Going back to those days, exactly. Mm -hmm. So a lot has changed. I mean, if you think about it, I mean, so that is, let's see here. So uh, ISO 9001 was uh, 87, 94, 2000, 2008, and 2015. So that's five versions. Five versions. Of um, so and it did change, remember, from one to two and three. Right, right. And um, into just 9,001. Exactly. So a lot of streamlining, a lot of high level structure. Now you talk about some of the other fields, uh, some of the other management systems, the environmental health and safety. Food yes. safety. There's a lot of different things. Um, so how has all that, you know, from your perspective, changed in terms of helping the auditor, maybe more important, the auditee, you know, do what they need to do to fulfill the, the, the requirements of ISO 9001? Well, I guess they've, they've been streamlined eventually. They've come up with a, a standard structure for all of the management system right. standards. Mm -hmm. 
Bear in mind, though, that management system standards are only one aspect of this. But for some, New Zealand was a, and still is a heavily export oriented country. So mm -hmm. we had three levels of, of compliance to do. You had domestic regulatory requirements just to be in business. You had uh, importing country requirements often to consider. And then you had these additional veneers of compliance that might be driven by retailers or, or customers of one sort or another. So we often worked in, in integration of some of those and worked towards some of that integration. But let me tell you, Mike, um, some of the other changes that we experienced because, mm. you know, when I started auditing, we started with pen and paper. We used to have a notebook. Yeah. We didn't have any of the electronics that we have no. these days. Yeah. And you, you wrote your notes as you went around doing the audit. And um, one of my colleagues, he used to have this... Um, uh, approach to it which we tried to talk him out of it he would he'd be writing his notes and when the non-conformance came he'd get the red pen out <laughs> <laughs> and he would write these down in red yeah. now from his perspective he was doing this in order to be able to find them quickly when we came to do a closing meeting of course but the effect on the RDT was... <laughs> that red, red pen whip out. <laughs> like, what did I do? Yeah, I was trying to look over at it and so on. So we wrote these notes. Then we would go back to the office. And at that time, we, I think, were promising them to get a... Um, an audit report to them within we'd left them a handwritten thing but uh get an audit report to them within 10 working days that's two weeks yeah. for a report yeah. yeah and we wrote out these reports in hand and at one stage in this we were working in a remote office we'd opened up because it was this was a real boom time it was mm -hmm. real boom time and you couldn't keep going fast yeah. enough and we'd opened up a regional office um three of us there i think we did not have any administrative support so wow. we used to write the report out fax it through to the head office typing pool who would then type it up fax it back to us yep. we'd correct it they'd fax it back to them back again then they posted the good copy version to us to post out to the customer wow you think about i mean how that's much how much changed you changed that's right that's right uh then we had somebody came up with the idea of us using laptops and letting go all the typing pool. So none of us knew how to type. Right, right. We didn't have any lessons in typing. But, but you learned. <laughs> away. And now I've, um, I've reached the heady level where I can type as fast as I can think these days, which is probably not very fast on either, <laughs> on either front. But we do all of that ourselves. Mm -hmm. So this was a lot of typing for non-professionals. And somebody came up with the idea of macros. So you could do, do you remember macros? Sure. And you had macros, so you you just put a set of numbers yeah, down, yeah, and yeah. then it was typed out. And all the film, yeah. You could do it. So we've we've come a long way in that respect. In a more practical sense, yes, you're right. There were those revisions of standards, mm -hmm. and uh, you had to go through professional development to keep up with each one of those changes. What were they? Your registrations with RIB QSA or IRCA, if you were somewhere mm -hmm. else in the world. Um, you know, you had to keep up with your professional development on those. And that, that was a good thing to do because the world isn't changing even faster now. Sure. You know, with those times, as you said, there was a, a period of standard period of seven years between revisions. Approximately. And then there used to be a three year implementation period. You'd have that, that time to, yeah. to, to implement it, right? Which was a, re a recertification cycle. Mm -hmm. And you inevitably found that there was a tidal wave built at the end and everything of in the last in the last couple of months or whatever months. Six, 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 yeah. but then when you started adding in these additional ones environmental management came next mm -hmm. as uh, far as i recall then there was health and safety sure. and the food safety now and and numerous others all with their own revisions processes going on mm -hmm. so the life of, yeah. well the life of an audit has become a lot more complex yeah. and uh, open to a lot more criticism it's always been the case that auditees or regulators and one of the problems for an auditor is that there are so many stakeholders have a vested interest in what you're doing so the perceptions of your competence can be quite different you've got your own organization mm -hmm. that wants you to be competent in the way that they needed to be done for i was an external third party auditor mm -hmm. so you've you've got a certification body you had an accreditation body needing to be satisfied that you sure. knew what you were doing mm -hmm. you also had the rdt both the one sitting in front of you and their, their organization yeah, of course. 
And for us, in a lot of cases, regulators as well. Mm -hmm. So you've got five or six people with an interest in this audit and all of them want to be satisfied that you're competent. Mm -hmm. From an auditee's perspective, the best thing they want is for you to say, yes, that's great. It's all great. That's all good. You pass. Uh, what the perhaps regulator wants is to see that you've done a thorough, comprehensive job and identified everything that needs to be identified, mm -hmm. both compliance and non-compliance. So when you added in these extra standards and uh, variations of them, and it, it became quite complex. Yeah. Now, when I started, um, this was a desirable career option, and we were pretty well paid. Mm -hmm. Now, put that in perspective, um, talking 1990, mm -hmm. um, these are New Zealand dollars, so somebody once said yeah. to me, New Zealand dollars, that's like Monopoly money, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's not real money, but it was real to us at the time. Of course, of course. And uh, I took a pay rise when I took that job from 25,000 to 50,000 a year. Double, yeah. And when I got my auditor registration, an extra 5,000, so 10%. 30, 30 some odd years ago. That was 35, 35 years, years ago. ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, was, that was a very good earning. So it was worth it. having. Yeah, yeah. And it was a desirable career option. Sadly, it's not as desirable these days. It's become a, a little more complex for a whole variety of reasons. Well, I was going to say, it's not just because necessarily of the dollars and cents, but no. there's there's some of these pressures you're talking about and, and you're referring to the, the red pen, your friend with the red pen. This idea that the auditor is a cop or as as the as the traffic cop somewhat to, to write citations, you know, write you up. Um, that's kind of passe now, right? I mean, that really is so, yes. it's not you know, the way it should be. I think that can still be the perception. And sadly, I, I think there are auditors that probably still behave that way to some yeah. degree. There's a, a, there's a sense of authority that comes with it that allows you to to do certain things. There are also cultural differences around the world when you audit in different places, mm -hmm. you find mm -hmm. different cultural expectations but ultimately it comes down to how you behave and it's the soft skills as much as the technical skills of the different standards or your knowledge of the industry that you're in yeah. uh, it shouldn't be a game of, uh, of gotcha yeah. in, in my view it's a it's a conversation with people and so on and there's actually a collaboration i think with the audits um they're there all the time. You know, I'm talking about the quality managers, the internal auditors, mm -hmm. the trainers, the, the you know, those people that are there in the industry all the time. And we come in as external auditors, maybe two or three days a year, perhaps. And you you certainly have a, a role to play in there. But that element of, uh, of effectiveness of the uh, managers on the site at the time is what really makes a difference. Sure. My background was food safety. And if you can imagine in food safety, it's important that you are compliant, but it's better that they're doing that themselves. You know, one of the definitions of quality is doing the right thing when nobody's watching. Right. And that's what you want is a culture of food safety. And now, uh, quite recently, we're seeing this uh, element of culture coming into the management systems as well, mm -hmm. as well as other things like um, very recently ISO's um, made some very minor amendments, but they're very significant, I think, in terms of addition to what impact are your product's going to have on the world. That's right. And it's a different, it, it's, it's. I don't even know if it's so much for the, the auditors, for the auditees need to really be mindful of this when they're creating their processes that, that are going to be essentially eventually audited by an, an auditor. They need to, I mean, Ultimately, we, we make this maybe somewhat more complex than it needs to be. Ultimately, what it's really about is you want to make sure that your, your processes are constructed in such a way that your products are safe and effective for the market in which you, you operate. That's right. You know, the context of the organization. That's really, I mean, that's really the core of the business is really making sure as an auditor you're going in and you're confirming that that is the way it that's is. That's right. No, that, that's the way I viewed it was yeah. establishing compliance yeah. and finding the evidence of compliance. And, and it would whatever way that they do that, that you know, you don't need that's to right. go in and say it's got to be this way. No, the way that they do it may work just fine or may not. But I mean, you need to be mindful of, the, of their culture and the way that they do things. And they may have a way of doing things that works just fine in compliance. They do. And the best way of doing that, frankly, is to do it properly. And then you don't have to prepare for the audit. Right. You're just, this is just how we do things around here. You know, mm -hmm. that sort of element to it. And, um, you know, the, the changes that are going on that we've just described, well, begun to describe around the auditing, are also going on for the auditees. Mm -hmm. They're learning things as well. So keeping up with technology in particular has been a rapidly increasing um, uh, event, but factor in our lives of all, all perspectives. I did microbiology at university mm -hmm. and uh, 
worked in the dairy industry, as I said, and I had a grand total of three pages of notes about dairy microbiology, but mm -hmm. that was enough to get me. There you go. Off. And I can tell you now, there are there are uh, elements of science within the dairy industry that we hadn't even heard of, literally hadn't heard of at that time. So, you, you know, keeping up with those things is is very much a part of it, too. Yeah, as you mentioned, there there are those technical skills that are they're ultimately extremely important, of course, if you're going to go in an audit organization mm -hmm. and the soft skills, as you mentioned, the people skills, the ability to to manage people, not manage people so much as just deal with people and, mm -hmm. and, and listen and 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 really kind of be compassionate to a certain extent as to what they're dealing with, what their mm -hmm. process is and and audit accordingly. Um, well, let me ask you this. I don't want to change the topic too much, but, I, I you know, we're here at ASQ. Um, and in their very historic building here in Milwaukee, which is kind of a museum, well, we'll see it maybe a little bit on the screen. It's kind of a museum of, of quality, um, but quality isn't, I mean, it, conformity assessment, even make it more broad, it, it isn't stuck in a particular time zone, I mean, or a particular past. Um, it really is about looking forward. So we're talking about 35 years that, that yes. our company's been in existence and the antecedents of this company, but you and I have been talking about this. We're more concerned about the next 35 years really, than, the, than the past one. So what does that look like? What well, else? you know, to me, I think that's a really good question. When you look at the 35 years done, yeah. and, and indeed before that, you know, ASQ 75 plus years. Right, old. exactly. So this, this is a legacy going back to the Second World War. And, you know, gentlemen like Mr. Duran here, we are yeah. a lot to, to thank them for. But what I would say is that that pace of change has escalated year on year and the rap you know the pace that we saw 35 years ago was a lot more manageable than mm. i think it is now but as you start to look forward i think what we need to just take on the chin it's going to keep changing mm. it's not going to stay the same at all and it doesn't mean that it can't be um a, a great career to go into yeah. i I loved my career. I one of the things that I got from it was a, a, a continual learning experience, and I'm not talking about in a, a formal way, but just out of interest. I saw industries and operations that I would never otherwise have seen, and indeed, I've seen parts of the world that I never would, otherwise would have seen. And uh, you know, I did some odd things over the time. We once used to audit a, a local authority council, and we did everything that they did. The zoo, the parks, the library, the swimming pools, and even the crematorium. Okay. And that was one of the last times that I went out to see an operation and went home materially changed in my mind because I, I understood things that I didn't know about before that. But there's humour in it all as well, you know, Mike. Um, I was doing an audit. I'm a little detour from the future here in the back <laughs> of the past. I was doing an audit to this uh, cemetery and crematorium, and it was a particularly wet day, mm -hmm. and the grave had been dug and prepared by the sextons, and the service was finished, and they brought the casket out and lowered it into the uh, into the grave, and the the priest was saying, a priest or a vicar was saying whatever he was saying over the casket, and he started talking faster and going faster. And the casket was starting to float on the well, water table that was in the <laughs> thing. So you've got to look at these things and just at, uh, sometimes work out what's actually important to have. <laughs> but to, to go back to your point about the future, I think it's actually really exciting. Mm. Uh, but I do think we've got to be ready for, actually, I think a quantum change. It might be organic, it might be, but it won't be a slow process. I talked earlier there about having a notebook and pen and paper mm -hmm. and typing. We did get to laptops. We have had to do remote audits in recent times, not least because of COVID, although the, the capacity to do that was already there, but seldom used. Right. But that's opened up a, a, a real um, uh, Pandora's box that you, you know, you're never going to go back from. But it, the, is it a good thing? Oh, it, well, I think it is, but I also think it's, it's inevitable. And whether you accept it's good or bad thing, it's, it's here, it's yeah. here to stay. But the, the emergence of technology is what really excites me about it and the possibilities of, of what we could do. And what will an auditor of 5, 10, 20, 35 years in the future look like? And indeed, what will the auditees look like? Mm -hmm. Will there still be quality managers or is that everybody's role in the organisation, which it probably should be? Mm -hmm. Is it about culture? Is it about um, internet of everything? 
and connectivity of those. Yeah. So I've got a, a an image in my mind of a younger person starting out as an auditor now and sitting here with you in another 35 years, because you'll only be you'll oh. only be 40 or so, <laughs> then, won't you? Um, 140, but, <laughs> but I, I feel that way. But, you know, and, and what will they tell you has changed? Yeah. Uh, I can imagine that this might sound a little far fetched, but is it really in this day and age that a, an auditor of the future can be auditing while they're sleeping because yeah. you've got an artificially intelligent assistant mm -hmm. who's monitoring uh, real time information on um, on the Internet uh, and perhaps even with direct feed from the organisation that you're looking at. So there's a connectivity there with their permission, of course, mm -hmm. that's identifying it's got some uh, expectation of what it's looking for. And when you get up in the morning, you go to your, 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 your array of technology mm -hmm. and you get a report what's happened with this particular company. And a lot of it will be perfectly fine. You're establishing the conformity because this is, you know, assurance is all about uh, trust, yeah. establishing trust and confidence. The way we've done it to date has always been about, let's look at the past, the records that you've got, your procedures, we'll look at today. And on the basis of that, we'll extrapolate our confidence forward. Mm -hmm. That at, the, at, at this time, you comply with this nominated standard. And therefore, we think if you maintain that, you'll you'll um, comply for the next year or so. But what if you could do it real time? Because you're not constrained by visiting the site as being your only methodology for uh, establishing conformance as you go through the year. Um, now I'm not. I'm not going. To, I must correct every my, anybody that would hear this as saying um, we we're going to stop going on site. I don't think we can. I don't think we should. I think it's a component of it, not the only part of it, though. So you get up in the morning, and uh, we've all learnt to work from home these days. You can sit in front of your screen and get a, a, a real time download of what's happened in your particular uh, account customers. And if it was food, for example, has there been any recalls? Has there been any products put on hold? Has there been any incidents coming out of the laboratory mm -hmm. that might um, expect you to just flag them? You don't have to do anything. You're just watching. Mm -hmm. And then by the time you do go on site, you've got a, a set of things that you want to see in a, a per consider. Yeah. But you could be using other technologies by like um, you could be using drones to to look around remote sites mm -hmm. or even remote parts of a site when you're on site you could be using um, uh, um, virtual assistants that will know not only the standard we used to be able to quote them mm -hmm. i could quote the standards couldn't do it now but i could quote them at the time okay. and i would tell you that clause 4.6.3 point something this is what it says you've got to do mm -hmm. Why do I need to do that when I've got an Alexa or a Siri that could tell me the same yeah, thing? Exactly. But why couldn't they also tell me case study? And why couldn't they also uh, tell me about the technicalities? You know, Chat GPT will do some of these things. Yeah, I'm, we're, right only, we're only scratching the surface of it. Mm -hmm. um, when you harness these, not to replace us, but to assist us, to uh, upskill us, upgrade us, then how powerful could we be then? And what the level of assurance is? And if yours, uh, your your experiences are, are connected into a big data set, mm -hmm. that you've got supply chain confidence. Right. So it, it's going to be as much learning to use technology as it was for us learning how to type. Right. Exactly. And just being comfortable with that technology and applying it in a set circumstance. Right. And then contributing your knowledge to the, the macro knowledge, which we don't at the moment, we don't do well. Yeah. Uh, you know, typically to date, uh, an audit has been, and, and this may be unfair to those that are doing much more than this and people are these days, but an audit would start, you did your manual review or your documentation review, you did your audit, your report, you cleared it, you filed, filed certification decision made, filed. Forget that one till next time you go. Then you'll have a quick look at what was the last thing was. Right. Follow those up and so on. Off we go. But they were they were sound bites. They were sound bites. They weren't pixels in a big picture. No. But why can't there be pixels in a big picture? And not only within that one organisation, but in that supply chain. Exactly. So that 
as a as a sector, as an industry, you can in HSECP in the food industry, critical control point is the one point at which you can do an ultimate control. Why can't you do that in the supply chain? By collaboration and using the technologies that it, are there. It exists to do it. So you're contributing your data sets to a macro data set, which allows you to then foreshadow things, become predictive a lot more than we're able to do now. Now, we used to sit as auditors when you'd, uh, you, you were in the middle of a job and you'd go away, stay at the hotel at night, and we were able to sit there perhaps having a, a shandy or something. It wouldn't be anything stronger than a shandy as we were away doing these things and saying, but you know what the real issue with that place is? Mm. Now, these days you've got social media, you've got so many other sources of information. Uh, is it fair target for them? Well, with their permission, why not? If it's all about brand, it's all about confidence, it's all about progression, well, why, why, why wouldn't not? you? Why is it there? It's there anyway. Right. Um, you know, what I think about is in the future, in the future of this industry, and what gives me a lot of um, a, a lot of good feeling about the future is that it's always going to be about process. It's always going to be about about processes of, of individual organizations and every organization, whatever they're doing, whatever they're either producing or whatever service they're delivering or transaction they're transacting, it's all about a process. Mm -hmm. So, you know, looking at those processes and then connecting them to some sort of an oversight, some sort of a standard or a body, a regulatory, what have you, is really the job. And there's always going to be an opportunity to do that because mm -hmm. there's always going to need to be these, these processes in any organization at any point in time. There's going to need to be those things. There has always been a standard, though, whether it was an ISO standard or a contract or even your own standard. Right. What what standard are you prepared to put out under your name? Right. And, yeah, and you're right. There was the, There's a process there. But I would add to that importantly that it's also about people mm -hmm. and you know in my auditing career um, I had the opportunity to learn these new things I mentioned earlier but I also came to a realization it was around about that time of doing uh, the cemetery and the crematorium because that was I'd seen something new which became less common because I saw a lot of the same things we are different to your industry. We we do things different. Well, no, you don't actually. You're doing them in the same way. You're just a different industry. Your chemical industry rather than mm -hmm. food, or your manufacturing, or your service rather. Than, but what they did all have in common is that they're all about people. It's all about people, and it's about culture. Funnily enough, it's about what are you prepared to put up with and do, and how much towards excellence do you want to be? Where on the continuum do you want to be? Do you want to just survive or do you want to thrive? Do you want to be a leading brand? Do you want to grow? You know, so, so a lot of it comes down to those practical things as, as well. The complexity of what we're doing, I think, is is partly the challenge. But aren't we lucky to have the technology that I was talking about to support you with it? We've got things coming down the pipe at us as you know, not only have we still got the quality, environmental health and safety and so on, but now we've got things like innovation and sustainability and ESG, mm -hmm. and, and they will continue. The more we are able to um, either by the measure or discern that we want to put together, then the more this will come down at the industry. If you're relying on that 30 year old that I was, to learn all of it, keep up to date all with it, satisfy all of those stakeholders all the time across eight or nine different products. You asked me to do that with my notebook and pen, it would have been a disaster. But ask me to do it in 10 or, well, maybe not as much as 10, even three, five, 10 years time with technology that's available. And I'll tell you what, I'd start my career again and do it all over again. Mm -hmm. And do it uh, maybe more efficiently even than you did back I, then. I would do it more efficiently with a greater degree of confidence at the risk of um, putting some science behind the audit process. If you were to do a statistical analysis of a typical audit process, it's not a high degree of uh, of confidence limits. You go in for two days a year when they're already prepared for it yeah. and they've got the records ready. You know, it's. It, it is not statistically representative representative yeah, exactly but if you were doing real time and it's continual monitoring then then why not yeah. my daughter Michael, I just out of interest she's an intelligence analyst and uh, we've talked about how uh, similar 
these two paths are. Both of them are about gathering information upon which you can make a decision. I believe we did a session at this, at did, this event did. a few years ago. We did. Both of you talking about that very yeah. idea. And uh, we should learn from them. We should bench, you know, benchmarking is one of the things that we do in, in quality and beyond. Yep. And we should benchmark not against just those that are in our own industry, so best in class, but against those that do it really well in other respects. Yeah, right. So where else do they gather information upon which to make decisions? Where do they do it in a forecasting sense, not just in a retrospective sense? Uh, take the food industry again. Wouldn't it be great if rather than having a great response when there was a listeria outbreak for the sake of argument, wouldn't it be great if we could predict with some confidence where that next outbreak was likely to happen and prevent it happening? You know, corrective action yes. and preventive yes. action. It's nothing new in there, yeah. but the tools that you've got should enable you to have a high degree of confidence, but also to anticipate yeah. with confidence. Yeah, it's great stuff. It's exciting. I mean, we're at an exciting nexus to this to this industry, and and uh, I think something like we're doing here with this expo is part of our our kind of our role in sharing information with everyone out there in our audience too. So thank you for doing that, Andrew. That was a lot of fun, and I hope, pleasure. Hope everyone out there got a lot out of it too. Now this isn't live, of course. We're doing this on demand. So if you have a, a question for Andrew or for any of us, and you want to kind of engage with some of these topics, uh, just write us at info at exemplarglobal.org and we'll have Andrew write you back or one of us will respond. Uh, and that's for any any of the events you see here uh, on our expo, just write us at info at exemplarglobal.org. Um, and if you've watched this session, you're eligible for CPD. So check that out and grab your CPD. Um, we have a lot of sessions at the expo. If you haven't watched them all, go check them out. I think you'll get a lot a lot out of our expo this year and hopefully you'll, uh, you'll enjoy uh, watching it as much as we've enjoyed putting it together for you. So thanks you all for being here. Andrew, thanks again for, for joining us and giving us that overview. Very Thank you, Mark. Interesting. Always a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Thank you all for being here. We'll talk to you and we'll see you at the next session here at Exemplar Global's Excellence in Auditing Expo 2024. So long.